Yeah, great question about like deleting the table. Um, I will try to address this question uh, during my presentation. So I'm going today uh, to talk about headless BI and semantic layers. You already heard about this today. So a um, couple words about myself. I'm co-founder and CTO at KubeDev, and I'm original author of a Cube. Um, I'm really fortunate to be able to manage right piece of software that has so many stars as a Presta has, but no one knows about it. Uh, does anyone know what the cube is? All right. Just some of you, but no, oh, not all of you. Let's fix this. So, um, all right. So let's talk about headless BI. Um, this is a term that was coined back in 2021 uh, by folks called uh, Basecase. So they basically noticed that in a modern data stack, you have a lot of data sources on one side and uh, a lot of data tools that consume the data on the other side. And uh, more importantly, you have a lot of folks uh, like in roles that consume the data within an organization. And uh, they, they were started to think about uh, what if all of this stuff is connected and uh, basically you'll end up with a picture as this. You, you end up with some really not structured piece in, in between. And they wondered if there should be something like as a category, category in a modern data stack that can fill this gap. So, and they ended up with a headless BI term. So, but not they, they actually like invented the idea itself. Uh, and um, basically this is like, if you start to think about like the headless BI layer and what precedes this, it, it's a semantic layer. And um, if you, as old as me, you probably seen pictures like this. Uh, um, and uh, basically the truth is, is actually a uh, semantic layer is um, still and was part of many, many BI tools out there. And, uh, um, but one, I guess, BI tool stands out, so, and this is Looker. So they were very successful to making semantic layer in a code, and uh, this is LookML, probably you're familiar with that. And uh, they were very commercial successful with it, and um, LookML was one of, uh, one of the keys in this success. And um, the year this Headless BI article went out, the Google announced um, that they're partner with Tableau, long-term competitor of Looker, to provide uh, Looker uh, with an API that will be able, uh, will allow like Tableau users to connect it to Looker and visualize data uh, with Tableau instead of Looker itself. So here we landed the headless BI term. So keep the semantic layer caching access control and decouple visualizations and you'll, you'll get the headless BI idea. So, and uh, if you follow modern data stack space, there, were, there, was, there was a lot of headless BI tools popping around um, in the last two years. Um, yeah, so let's talk about headless BI architecture. Um, so at Cube, we believe that there are four um, uh, base pieces of headless BI uh, architecture is data modeling, access control, caching, and APIs. So uh, let's go through each of those. So if you think about like data modeling or semantic layer, there was uh, innovation in the uh, last decade. Uh, it, it's called um, Live Query, and most of BI tools support it. It's basically uh, BI tools uh, that can generate a SQL and uh, offload all query execution inside of 
data warehouse instead of downloading the data. And all modern BI uh, tools suffer this approach. And uh, if, you, if you're familiar with a more old school approach, uh, it used to be like downloading the data and every BI tool supported downloaded, downloading the data. And um, so, and data modeling, um, like uh, in terms of how you can generate this SQL code, uh, is usually end up uh, in, in another code, and it's um, usually like multi-dimensional model. So it's called uh, very different. Uh, it, it has very different names and very different tools. Uh, we call it cubes. And it's actually, historically, it called ALAP cubes. Uh, or if you're familiar, familiar with the term, it's called relational lab. So it allows you to define your data model in terms of cubes, measures, dimensions, etc. And then this model is used to generate SQL for your data warehouse. So on top of this first piece, you add in uh, multi-tenancy and security control. This will allow you to do stuff, very simple stuff, from uh, role-based access security, hiding columns, uh, restricting like uh, roles with role level access security, and um, uh, also doing very crazy stuff like uh, uh, measuring your API quotas, for example. Yeah, so all of that can be done as a, as a, a part of access control. Then there. Are Caching goes, and we think caching is a very essential piece of um, headless BI. And every BI tool, by the way, has some sort of caching. And there are two types of caching. It's in-memory caching and uh, so-called aggregation awareness. And this use case, by the way, uh, one of the most major use cases for all of our Presta customers and Athena customers, because uh, as you may know, like, uh, Presta can be not very like responsive for really big queries. It will take like 10, 60 seconds, maybe minutes uh, to process like single query. But if you aggregate the data, materialize in a um, very efficient store uh, in Cube, we built our own, which is called Cube Store, and, and it's capable to serve like billions of rows um, in a single cache table. And uh, this allows your users to access uh, this aggregates instead of raw data and basically optimize user experience here. Um, and uh, last but not least, it's in, um, basically APIs. So there are two types of APIs in Headless BI. So first one is obviously SQL. And um, uh, this um, API allows you to connect all uh, basically data tools because all of these tools speak SQL. And there are two approaches with SQL. Uh, one is basically to provide, um, to mimic some protocol, for example, Cube mimics Postgres and Redshift. Another way, as dbt does, uh, you can use templating and proxy some workload to uh, data warehouses. Yeah, so, uh, and we see both of those used um, um, in uh, various tools. And this, again, this SQL API allows you to uh, connect uh, your headless BI to other BI tools for visualization and because of live query mode. So you, you can uh, offload your query processing to headless BI instead of data warehouse. But Headless BI, on the other hand, uses uh, the SQL to generate SQL for data warehouse. And that's um, how this question about deleting table comes together. So you can rename, actually, drop tables under un underlying like data sources, in underlying data sources. But actually, for your users, it will be the same table. So nothing changes for users. So it provides your uh, decoupling of actual data, which lies in your data source from uh, what your users see in API, in this particular SQL. Um, 
And another um, SQL, oh, sorry, another API, which is um, REST and GraphQL API, is very helpful when you're trying to build uh, embedded analytic solution and you uh, basically at the point where you want to build a uh, custom uh, build UI and have a really native experience for, for your application for, and for your customers. All right. Um, so let's talk about trade offs. Yeah, I will talk about only um, semantic layer trade offs mostly and uh, like data modeling trade offs. So once you go with this approach, um, there are uh, basically main general trade offs you can think of. It's um, is it's control versus flexibility, and it's uh, how much you define on your semantic layer and your semantic layer uh, data modeling layer versus how much you model on your BI side of things. Let's consider this specific example. Uh, for example, we want to calculate daily active users uh, to weekly active users ratio, and there are two ways of doing this calculation. Uh, you either can model this calculation right in the, into your, uh, in, inside your BI tool or any data uh, consuming tool, uh, basically by dividing uh, two of those measures, or you can uh, define this uh, at your data modeling uh, uh, layer. And um, the trade-off here would be what if this metric definition would change in future, right? So if it changes in future, everything what depends on this metric will be updated automatically. And in the case you allow users to write their own uh, calculations, it's not. However, once you hide all this uh, uh, like uh, specific measures like daily active users and weekly active users, uh, people can do their own calculations anymore. So this is trade-off uh, around control and flexibility here. Uh, another one example would be joins. So pretty the same idea as in previous example, however, uh, more complex one in terms of uh, w what can be allowed and, and what's not. So uh, let's, for example, uh, think about uh, this model like orders customers and then we allow people to join them in a BI tool, right? Uh, you also can um, use feature of cube so-called views um, or in Looker it's called explorers and to fix actually all the join paths and it will be either uh, star schema or snowflake schema and all join paths will be preset and users cannot change it. And uh, however, uh, uh, in this case, users can change how, how joins behave, right? So again, this will, will be a trade off about control versus flexibility and what user can query and what's not. Um, and pretty same example is a uh, role security. So, uh, you can expose all the fields which can be used for uh, basically filtering your data uh, on a like semantic layer side or like headless BI side, right? But on the other hand, you can delegate all the role level security to your semantic layer. And in this key case, so you, you actually uh, don't need to think about uh, authentication and Oh, no, sorry, not authentication, about authorization on ABI stuff and maintain it. Yeah, you just delegate it to semantic layer. And if it changes, all, all downstream data tools can receive this update. Yeah, on the other hand, you remove any like flexibility to control any security features on uh, inside of downstream tools. Yeah, so yeah, thank you. That's That's it from my side. And I would love to take your questions, if any.